Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Menno is in session. And welcome back to Faith on Trial. I'm Deacon Mike Mano, your host. I'm sitting here in the studio with Gina No, our co-host. Gina, how are you this morning? I'm well. I'm well. It's a beautiful day, and it, I'm happy to be here. It is a very beautiful day. Now, we had uh, last night, there was a uh, yeah, well, presidential we, debate. Right, because we record on Thursday. Yeah, we record That's on Thursday, right. remember? Um, w- did you have a chance to look at it, or did you not? Do you know, Deacon Mike, um, I don't gain much, hadn't gained much from the first two, so I decided not to tune into this one. Probably a wise choice. I, yes. I did watch it. I'd like to see a leader that shows some restraint and respect for their competitors. And that doesn't appear at all at a, well, at a Republican debate. I, I was greatly impressed by Nikki Haley. Well, I, I think she did a good job. I honestly think, uh, I think they're think all capable, doing but mm-hmm. yeah, she, it's great. She's very well-spoken and has a real good um, grip on the issues and where she's very solid in where she stands That's on right. those issues. Um, so good for her. I, I, you know, and, and what a great example to all the young women um, in this country that think that the Republican Party is not a place for women. Yeah, well, it is, and she certainly showed it, and she held her ground against some severe attacks last night. But we will see how it plays out. Of course, the uh, the top guy wasn't there again. Uh, yeah. He was having his own uh, rally someplace. I did and, tune into the rally for a little yeah. bit, and then I thought, mm, can't watch this either. <laughs> yeah, he, and, he <laughs> and he continues in a New York courtroom, and uh, so we'll see how all that comes out. I, uh, I think uh, what is happening is a lot of his uh, legal troubles— are actually benefiting him right now. There's a, a certain a, a number of people that are kind of rallying around him, seeing that, hey, uh, this guy is being picked on. and uh, Unjustly. Uh, unjustly. Yeah, unjustly right. and, persecuted. And um, uh, we had a, a, a case here, or a paper here wanted to talk about um, Barry Weiss, wrote on the DEI. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But Barry Weiss wrote an interesting comment uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, she thinks that a lot of people are, after seeing what is being done to Trump and his family, and after seeing everything that has come out from the Hunter Biden thing and all that, that he was really telling the truth back in 2020 and was censored. And there's more support out there for him now than there might have been. I thought that was kind of an interesting concept. So. Absolutely. Have you seen um, Dinesh D- D'Souza's uh, Police State yet, the the movie? No, I've not seen the movie, but we have a promo of it up on our w- web page. Yes, mm-hmm. I would encourage everyone to see it because I think that movie really exemplifies when um, Donald Trump says, I'm doing this because this could happen to you. I'm fighting this because th- you're next. That movie really exemplifies that statement. When you talk about uh, your next, Mark Hulk uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, he was a pro-life um, advocate, prayer, prayer warrior outside of, of a, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. And he went down the block because somebody, uh, one of the Planned Parenthood escorts, was uh, harassing his child and got into a confrontation down there. The FBI raided his house. You know, with armed agents, with his kids there, and took him away. Right, and right, and he was found, and he went through the whole uh, prosecution by the Department of Justice, and the courts found him not, not guilty. guilty. And now he's suing the DOJ. We just saw that this morning. That'll he's be an interesting case. We should cover that on one DOJ. of our programs. We will, and yeah. and of course, uh, he's announced for Congress. 
Yes, he's, he's running for office. I think there's a, a we should do a program on that also because there are quite a few um, individuals uh, who suspended FBI agents or um, well, we've had or military individuals Kyle who were Sarah released from the um, right. But Kyle, Kyle's not running for office, but there are quite a few that have decided to uh, get into the uh, po- into politics. Never planned on doing it, and now they're running for office. So. Um, that'll be an interesting um, summary of, of those individuals and how their races are going. You know, I remember when we started this program, Mike Peters, who was uh, the manager here at the time, asked me, do you have enough information to keep this program going? And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, what you're talking about, we ought to do all of that. We're only on once a week or we only tape once a week. I guess they play it twice over the weekend. But, uh, yeah, we could probably, if we had the time and the funds, probably do almost a daily program on this stuff. It seems like there's a wave of persecution against people of faith using our government against us, and um, I think we highlight quite a bit of it here on and the And now show. we see the persecution against a lot of Jews. Right. And the government is kind of turning a blind eye to it. Right. Right. So um, you're next, I guess. Yeah, you're <laughs> next. All right. Today on the show, we have Althea Cole, who is from the Cedar Rapids Gazette. She's a commentator with the Cedar Rapids Gazette, and she's followed this case of the parents versus the Linmar School Board up in her area, which she wrote a nice story about it, and we've been trying for a week or so to get her on, and she's able to make it today, and so we're going to talk to her about that. Yeah, Linmar is probably, in Iowa, one of the biggest offenders of so much of the legislation that our legislators have tried to protect our children with in Iowa. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear her story because they really have struggled over there. Uh, every time the uh, school board is um, denied doing whatever it is they want to do, they turn around and try something else. And yeah, so yeah. those parents are That's very frustrated. That's going to be an interesting story, and we'll talk to her about but that. But I have to say, yeah. Lynn Mar is one of my favorite schools to uh, for diving meets. You know, my children were oh, yes, divers, right. and they have the most beautiful facilities I've of all of them we were ever in. So oh, very good. They maybe have lots can, of money in their yeah, facilities. Maybe we can straighten out the board. All right, and then we're going to have Lisa Bourne, who is uh, from Heartbeat International. She's editor of their Pregnancy Help News, and we're going to talk about a uh, situation where we've got a bunch of state attorney generals that are now attacking crisis pregnancy centers, which is not new, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Uh, are they uh, coalescing? I mean, is there a coalition of them to do this in yes. unison, or is it something that the individual the, AGs have decided nope, to do on their own? They're ganging up. No kidding. Yeah, oh, that'll up. be we'll interesting. Talk, we'll talk to Lisa about that. Yeah, That'll be yeah. good. All right, do you have a prayer to open us up with? I do. A prayer for peace today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of peace, bring your peace into our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of this earth. Turn your way of love to those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us all in hope, and give us the wisdom and the courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign among nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. Thank you, Gina. We'll be right back with Athea Cole from the Cedar Rapids Gazette. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we have with us right now Athea Cole, who is the uh, columnist for the uh, Cedar Rapids Gazette, where I once worked. And uh, Althea, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We uh, want to talk about this case that you uh, were writing about, uh, the parents versus the Linmar School District. And um, if you can kind of go back and give us the genesis of this story and let us know what the problems were uh, between the school board and the parents. Yes. So um, I am an alumnus of Linmar High School in Marion, Iowa. Uh, I graduated in 2002, and shortly before my 20th class reunion in April of 2022, the school board passed a policy, uh, transgender and students nonconforming to gender role stereotypes. It was passed on a 5-2 to two vote of the school board, um, and the policy contained three parts with which parents took umbrage. The first part of the policy was that a student could use 
whichever bathroom or locker room that corresponded with their gender identity, even if it did not uh, correspond with their biological sex. Uh, And that also included to overnight accommodations such as hotel rooms if there was an overnight field trip. The second part was that a student could choose a gender identity plan, have that on file with the school district, and if the student wanted to adopt a different gender identity, choose a different name, the school would have that on file and um, enforce that at the school, while if the student chose keeping that secret from the parents. There was no particular threshold of abuse or anything like that that the student had to show the school for why they did not want to keep it from their parents. It was just as simple as, eh, I don't want my parents to know about this. Those two parts in particular were addressed by legislation passed in the State House during the 2023 legislative session. Um, there was a bill requiring students to use, anybody in the building, to use restrooms and locker rooms and overnight accommodations that corresponded with their biological sex. And also the other part that was um, addressed by the legislature was the uh, gender support plan. A student can still have a gender support plan, but they must, uh, the school must notify the parents. There, can, there can't be anything kept from the parents. The third part, however, was still intact, and that was addressing the use of preferred pronouns. So if a student adopted a different gender identity, um, if, if a male student uh, identified as non-binary or female, the male student could request to be, uh, to be addressed by pronouns of they, them, or she, her. And the policy stated that not respecting a student's gender identity, including those pronouns, was akin to bullying and harassment. And bullying and harassment was already defined not only in the school policy, uh, but there are also bullying and harassment laws in Iowa State Code. Given that that still was an issue, the lawsuit that a group called Parents Defending Education filed on behalf of several concerned parents in the district did find that the policy was too broad and could be enforced in a manner that violated the free speech rights of Lindmar students. So the policy was enjoined from being enforced. Essentially, that does um, essentially strike down the last part of Lindmar's policy. So none of the original policy remains, but it did take that lawsuit to address that third and final part of the policy. Now, as I understand the case, uh, originally in the district court, level uh, before the parts one and two were taken out. That was all upheld by the court? A district court did um, did decline to enjoin the policy, okay. um, finding that the parents had not properly demonstrated actual injury to their students. All right. And, and the parts one and two were thrown out, I guess, when it went up on, uh, on appeal because by then the legislature had acted. Parts one and two of the policy that we discussed, the um, the bathroom issue and then the gender support plan, because they were addressed in the state house, the claims that the parents had made in the lawsuit were found moot on appeal okay. because they had been addressed. Okay. And from what, from what I understand, Lynn Marr was one of the biggest violators of these kinds of rights of the students and parents and was the impetus for a lot of the legislation that came through the uh, legislature in 2023. I don't know if it's accurate to say that Linmar was one of the biggest violators overall because other school districts did have similar policies. And I, I think um, gender nonconformity, uh, transgender identity, um, we see the skyrocketing rate of transgender identity in youth now, and that's going to be an issue happening across the board in the state of Iowa. However, Linmar definitely was the core focus of the issue because of this federal lawsuit and because of the attention the school district received at the federal level, including from presidential candidates. You had uh, former presidential candidate Mike Pence visit the area in February of this year talking about the lawsuit, Um, and then you had him even mention that during the first Republican presidential debate back in August. Interesting. Now, what was the reaction of the public, if you can kind of put your finger up to the wind and see which way things were blowing? So the reaction of the public to the um, the initial passage of the policy um, was uh, 
quite a lot. The board, or the meeting at which the board passed the policy, and again, that was on a five to two vote. Um, the meeting lasted, I believe, for about five hours. It was live streamed on YouTube when I caught it. And I had an engagement that night that took me away for two hours. And when I went back to the YouTube to see if the meeting was still going, I was shocked. And it went until, I think, almost 10 o'clock that evening. Why? Because there was a lot of public comment. And the majority of the public comment was, we can't believe you're doing this. Where is your common sense? Now, was that all of the commentary? No. There still are plenty of people uh, who believe that this policy was a good thing. They see it as inclusion of LGBTQ students who face bullying and harassment and higher rates of suicide and suicide attempts. And their contention was that without this policy, students will ultimately be harmed. Um, I tend to disagree with that, as was made very clear in my commentary right. over the over the plan. I've written several articles about this, most recently um, about the the lawsuit being, um, or rather, the the final part of the policy being made dead on appeal. Um, but yeah, to say that 100% of the public was against it is unfortunately incorrect. Um, but I think, nevertheless, the public um, did underestimate how many people were just kind of shocked by the policy. Did it affect the elections on Tuesday for the Linmar School Board? It did, perhaps not to the degree that some thought or expected. Um, given that uh, the state legislature addressed two of the issues in the policy, and the final was addressed uh, in, the, in the Federal Court of Appeals, ultimately, there's no more action at this time by the school board needed to address any of the further parts of the policy as far as getting rid of them. None of it can be enforced right now. And so although it was still a hot topic of the school board race as to, you know, hey, uh, the uh, the people in favor of the incumbents were saying, you know, they're the ones we can trust to uphold inclusion for LGBTQ kids. And then you have on the other side um, people supporting the de facto challengers saying, this is what this board did. This is, you know, their priority for your children, and they should elect, and you should elect new people because of that. Now, did any of the uh, so-called challengers win? Uh, there were there were four people uh, running on one ideological side for two uh, for four seats, and then there were a slate of four people, including two incumbents and their allies uh, on the pro LGBTQ side. Um, the slate with the two incumbents and their allies did win on Tuesday. Um, and so although this was an issue, we see from the race it wasn't the only issue. Okay. What were some of the other issues? And I, I take it they were local issues. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say I, I mean when I say local issues, I really mean state issues. Um, mm -hmm. because the a lot of the commentary in the race and I, I saw constituents or voters I should say, um, asking would be board members, aka candidates how do you feel about book banning? Yes or no? Um, and so another piece of legislation in the state house was to um, uh, pass a law to say, you know, books containing this, this, and that kind of content cannot be included in a school library. And we understand why, because whether anybody wants to admit it or not, yes, there is content in library books that is um, a little bit more mature than what a student should be reading, even at the high school level. Um, unfortunately, addressing that in state law is very, very difficult. Addressing that in law at any level, including policy, uh, means that if you if you put certain words into, into the law, um, you have to write it out, which means that, unfortunately, it's going to uh, simply ban certain titles. Uh, there are going to be unintended consequences of which titles are banned, uh, and it's more difficult to do than the state legislature was willing to acknowledge, unfortunately. And that meant that it wasn't about, in terms of what the voters thought, it wasn't about getting rid of content that should not be included. It was boiled down to book ban. Do you support a book ban? Do you not? There was very little nuance in the actual debate for school board candidates. 
as to, you know, if they supported the removal of some titles, why? It was all, do you believe across the board the books should be banned? I think that was a big issue, and ultimately that was something that did not do any favors for the candidates who opposed the transgender inclusion plan. And ultimately it was a big help to those who did want to continue with some sort of transgender inclusion plan. In, in my district here, we had um, the West Des Moines School District. We had different candidates, again, falling on different sides of these issues. And I remember one of the liberals who actually won uh, said something to the effect that uh, she realized that uh, there were certain uh, restrictions placed on them in these areas by the legislature. But her job then was to uh, interpret that as narrowly as possible. In other words, he wanted to get up as close as he could to the line. I take it that's kind of the uh, the same mantra that was being talked about in Linmar, too. A little bit, but not as much. I, I mean, I, I tend to agree that when you have a state law that ultimately results in banning of certain books, and as hard as it is to admit, Yes, that is what the state law accomplished, the banning of certain books in a library. And that should be interpreted as nearly as possible so that you do not ultimately censor certain materials that could be of educational value to kids. Right. I don't Unfortunately, think... Unfortunately... I was going to say, I, I don't think she was referring necessarily to, to the book ban. She was referring more to the uh, use of pronouns and all this other stuff that uh, that Linmar was involved in. But no, you make a good point. It's, it's tough. And, and what the problem is... Is it's a common sense thing? You know, do you have a book here that's uh, uh, that's good for a, a third grader? The third grader is going to understand it, or is it going to be way over their head? Or is it going to be giving them concepts that they don't need to know at this point? And that's common sense. That's not necessarily banning a book, but I can see where the people who were opposed came up with this book ban idea. It's like kind in Florida, don't say gay. You know, that wasn't that wasn't the law, but they use that as the as the argument. Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, when you rely on voters to elect you to office, it doesn't necessarily matter what is correct and incorrect. It matters what the voters think and what they believe and what is on their minds when they go into the polls. Perception is reality in their mind. When it comes to elections, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, how was the reaction to your column and your uh, writing about this in the Gazette? Uh, well, it, it, it definitely was a widely read column um, based on internal statistics that we receive at the Gazette. Um, there was a lot of support for the column. A lot of that is private support because it is. Uh, it can be very daunting to speak about transgender issues in public when you are concerned about the lengths to which school districts and the general public is willing to go to include and affirm a transgender identity. Um, because I think a lot of people agree it has gone too far. But given what you will be called um, by people who disagree with you, uh, you'll be called a bigot, you'll be called a transphobe, um, you'll be called hateful. Um, it's very, very scary to speak out about that publicly. And I can confirm that because, of course, those who um, disagreed, disagreed quite strongly with my article. Um, it's more easy for them to write comments like that on social media. A couple of them still send private emails. Um, I got you know, a phone call with somebody who wanted to scream obscenities at me. That phone call did not last very long for obvious reasons. Um, but the reaction was on both sides. The good news is, uh, and people should take comfort of this, the reaction was more, I'm glad you wrote this. Even though it was mostly private reaction, most people do still understand common sense. They just want to keep their understanding of common sense very, very private, out of fear of public reprisal uh, and what could be done to their reputation. Because, yeah, you know, if you've got people calling your business saying, I want this person fired because they're hateful, if you see your name, you know, splashed all over social media as a bigot, nobody wants to be called that. Um, it's 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 problematic to say the very least. 
And not to mention what the, I would say, the, go uh, ahead. the FBI investigations on people who speak out at <laughs> school board meetings. And I'm not saying that in jest. It, it happens. It, it's, it's definitely unfortunate. And, you know, I don't want to imply that the FBI is investigating anybody who dares uh, publicly speak, you know, at a school board meeting uh, against transgender inclusion policies is going to be investigated by the FBI. But we do know uh, that in other school districts nationwide, yeah, the FBI showed up at the doors of a few people who were removed from school board meetings and you know we've the had, whole we've uh, had one of the FBI whistleblowers on our program Kyle Serafin and uh, he's discussed some of this with us so we, we kind of know what's going on out there maybe don't know the full extent of it but uh, it is happening and and you're right there are places where the FBI has shown up on people's doors yeah, ultimately it really is necessary for more who see transgender inclusion policies, see the lack of common sense in which they are first passed, um, with which they are first passed, and then with which they are later enforced, they do have to speak out. Yes, it requires a little bit more finesse and wisdom in speaking out than some have opted to embrace, and that doesn't help uh, conservatives, Republicans, and, and everybody else who strongly disagrees with how school districts and other public entities have chosen to uh, embrace gender identity nonconformity. But it does require people to speak out and say, this is not a good thing. This could hurt people. This could hurt the very people it was designed to help and a lot of others. Well, I'm very happy you were able to join us today. I know it's taken us a little while to make the right connection to get and get the right time for this, uh, so I appreciate that. We are running a little bit out of time. Jeannie, you look like you're ready to say something again. Oh, I just I wondered if this legal case was going any further, or is it, is it over? At this time, I'm not aware of any plans that Lamar has to appeal, but if we learn that there is another chapter to the story, um, you will see it written about in the pages of the Cedar Rapids Gazette. Good. Great. Good. Well, we're glad you stay on these issues and you write about them because so many times nobody hears about these things, and I'm glad that the Gazette is taking the lead in doing that, and I certainly appreciate uh, your uh, being here with us today and telling us this story. We appreciate that. It is an important one. It is. Thank you it very is. much for having me. It is, certainly. Thank you very much for joining us. Althea Cole from the Cedar Rapids Gazette, and we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're still listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, and we have with us right now Lisa Bourne from Heartbeat International, who is the editor of the Pregnancy Help news that uh, Heartbeat publishes. Uh, welcome again to the program. You're certainly, at least, not a stranger to us here. I'm happy to be here with you, as always. Yes, yes. Um, you released a story uh, at Heartbeat, uh, uh, at the Pregnancy Help News, about these 16 attorney generals that are attempting to censor pregnancy <clears throat> help centers. Uh, you want to explain what is going on there? Because we we still see this argument over abortion, even after the Dobbs decision. Well, if anything, the Dobbs decision has brought the pro-abortion contingent to more of a frenzy than before. So, I, And I would uh, uh, put this underneath that category. Um, it's an open letter that 16 attorneys general, led by California AG Rob Bonta, penned or released on October 23rd. And, and um, they're, they're really kind of repeating a lot of what the abortion industry tries to say without substantiation. You know, it, it's, it's a mantra that gets repeated over and over, and the media, of course, is only too willing to pick it up and repeat it. Um, the three points that they try to make in the letter um, are that pregnancy centers do not provide full scope of reproductive health care. Well, their definition of reproductive health care is abortion, so of course the pregnancy health centers don't do that. Um, and they also try to say that the pregnancy centers use deceptive tactics to lure patients in. Um, who, you know, patients who would be seeking actual, in their words, reproductive health care. Well, their source for that is NARAL, um, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is a, a point I do make in my article is most of the sources that they use are openly, unabashedly pro-abortion sources to substantiate these baseless claims. And the third one is that... Um, 
because uh, they're delaying these patients from getting the actual reproductive, reproductive health care, excuse me, of abortion, that they're harming, harming patients. And again, um, all of their sources and footnotes go back to different uh, voices that are decidedly in the camp for abortion. One of them, interestingly enough, is a, um, a document written by or released by a gender or feminist law journal from Columbia that talks about how it, this very thing, how attorneys general can target pregnancy centers. Um, so this, this, I think it's from 2020, if I'm not wrong, and, it, and it's, it's right there in the footnotes, and it's kind of a playbook that appears that a lot of them are going from ways to combat. Uh, it even says what's old is new again, that they're <laughs> in the title of the document that they're rehashing old. Well, these uh, are, you know, these are arguments that I heard years ago when I sat on the Board of Intervisions, uh, and, mm-hmm. and you're familiar with my history. You know, I was part of the original committee that got together that set intervisions up, and I ser- served on the board for at least six years after that. And uh, and we heard all of these things at the same time, and of course none of them were true. We never told anybody they couldn't go to uh, Planned Parenthood for your abortion. Uh, we One of the things that I know that we did was that we made sure that the information that we gave people was, was honest and accurate, because the whole idea was that uh, we're not judging you going to respect you to make the right decision, but we are going to give you accurate information. Well, the interesting thing about that as well as is that these pregnancy health centers, and that can refer to a pregnancy center or pregnancy medical clinic, and the difference, as you know, is a medical director would be overseeing the medical clinic, and more and more centers are becoming medical because they understand that this would be able to better serve women by being able to right. provide a full scope of things in it. That extends to having nurses on staff, uh, limited ultrasound, that sort of thing. Um, so whether, you know, pregnancy help kind of refers to a- anything that, that helps women in pregnancy, because that could also be adoption agencies and maternity homes. But these pregnancy centers or pregnancy medical clinics, they are there for the women whether or not they choose life. They, they, they give them the information, like you say, Deacon, here, here's all the information. And, and, of course, they hope and pray that they're going to choose life for, for them and their child. Um, but countless times when the woman does not, they are there to help her pick up the pieces. A lot of what they do is also abortion recovery right. care. And, and that, that gets kind of you know thrown out because the narrative for the abortion industry is that women don't regret this. It's, it's empowering. And, and they don't like to ever acknowledge that there'd be any question or concern or hesitance, let alone regret. And so, yes, to your point, you give you, the centers, give them information. If they choose to, to have an abortion, they're there for them the next day regardless. Right. So that, that kind of gets lost in all this noise. Right, and, and you're correct. There's a number of people that came back after having the abortion with the regrets. And I, I, can, I can tell you, uh, as a clergyman, that I have dealt with a lot of women that have had problems with abortion, and they, to a to a, a woman, they regret what they have done. Now that doesn't mean they wouldn't do it again if the circumstances were right for them or wrong for them, but this this is something that they do regret, and it weighs on their conscience. Absolutely, and, and Heartbeat, um, as the largest network of pregnancy help, both in the U.S. and internationally, the centers. And this goes for centers, whether they're affiliated with Heartbeat or not. They are those, there for those women, no matter how many unplanned pregnancies they have, no matter how many abortions they may have. They're there to support these women. And, and there's there's no money in it. Most of these organizations are nonprofits that function on private donations for the most part. And most of the services, nine out of ten times, I, you know, I don't have that more often than not, let's put it that way, Overall, the majority is that they are provided at no cost to the women, their children, and these families. Absolutely, the family. That was so. my experience here when I was on the board. Yeah, everything was free. We raised uh, money from private donations, and we weren't trying to make any money off the deal. Uh, we provided everything that was needed. It was provided free of charge. Whereas on the other side, uh, they're sending people to Planned Parenthood who are making money off of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always a case of follow the money. Mm-hmm. Um, 
anytime you've got, uh, whether there's teeth in it or, or it's just noise in the media, saber rattling, any, anytime you see things like this, you always have to ask, you know, what, what, who's, who's got something to benefit here? Um, you know, who, who's got the, where's the bottom line? Follow the money. And, you know, they're, they're, nobody's getting rich by helping women choose life. No, nobody absolutely, you know, they're, they're getting rich in, in God's kingdom, obviously, but no one is being, you know, made wealthy by making money, by helping women to choose life. There, there's no money in that, per se. So, But um, there's a satisfaction you know, of knowing that you've helped. Absolutely. You know, oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, one of the, the right thing. Yeah, I think one of the... One of the Greatest things I've ever, I haven't done that many great things in my life, but one of the greatest mm. things I think was being involved with Intervisions as we got it started and helping those people. Well, the, I'll the, mention that to St. Ever... Peter when I get to the gate. <laughs> there you go. No, you know, and, and honestly, it's these women, the, the people that work in pregnancy help, they, they know this. Or it's it's part of their being, or they wouldn't be doing this. But it's not like they're nobody's patting themselves on the back. I can right. assure you that as, as well. They're just convicted in in the fact that every woman deserves love and support in her unplan if they're experiencing an unexpected pregnancy. They should not feel alone. They should not feel coerced or hopeless. They should never feel like the only choice they have is to end their child's life through abortion. And I, I, you know, I don't have statistics, but just in my years of covering this. This issue, and certainly with heartbeat, you know, over and over again, you hear, you know, if, if I'd only known, if, if, if you know, they, all the pressures of life are insurmountable at the time, the best answer to abortion is another person there with you saying, mm-hmm. it's okay, take a deep breath, don't make a hasty decision. And that's what these pregnancy help centers do. And the fact of the matter, Deacon and Gina, is that the folks that support abortion, they just don't like that. They don't like that the pregnancy health centers provide an alternative to abortion. They, they, which, again, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. The term choice is false on its face because no human being chooses to, be, to be, have their life ended in the womb. But it's also false because overwhelmingly we hear about women who felt like they had no other choice. Well, especially when the father wa- when the father walks out on them, because that's a lot of these cases where they right. have a boyfriend that isn't going to stay with them. They go have the abortion, leave me alone. Yeah. I and I can't yeah. um, it, really. When Dobbs' case was overturned and Roe v. Wade overturned uh, last year, my first thought was, we still need a change of heart in in America. Yep. You know, these continual votes that um, life loses in, in uh, across our nation shows that we really need a change of heart. And, we, and I think pregnancy centers, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're doing the hard work of helping to educate people about their options, women about mm-hmm. their options. Um, and, uh, I, you know, not only are these attorney generals working against that education of our country and, and our women, so is our uh, our internet service providers. Your article did a great job of pointing out how Google and Yelp have really um, a- affected the ability of people to learn about the pregnancy centers and to learn about their cho- quote unquote choices when they have a crisis pregnancy. It's pretty much an ongoing thing with the with the tech folks as well. Um, that's you know we haven't we haven't had anything recently. The thing that's going on right now is referenced in their letter, the AG's letter of the the lawsuit right now with Yelp. Um, Yelp has acted to label pregnancy centers a certain way so as to um, kind of put pigeonhole them or put them into a, a hole that that uh, kind of degrades the work that they do. And um, they have pushed back against the pregnancy centers that have spoken and said, "Hey, this is not how we care to be." Defined. This is not how we define ourselves, whether it be faith-based or not. Most pregnancy centers do have some element of a faith base in their foundation, but that that doesn't speak for everyone. Um, and really, you know, that's a good way to go because when when you are are doing things for that reason, it provides you a, a, an element of. Uh, legal protection, shall we say, but it's also why you're doing it in the first place, because God said. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Yelp wanted to identify or wants to identify pregnancy centers what against their will, how, how they should be labeled, and, and that's the basis for the lawsuit that's going on right now over that. But, it, you know, it's Google as well and Facebook. It's a constant uphill battle, um, whether it's pregnancy help, 
um, or other aspects, different elements of it. It's, you know, we're constantly seeing in the news every day how anything that's remotely conservative or traditional has been um, over the last several years uh, at a high level being uh, censored by the the tech elites and and folks that, um, you know, have a different ideology, shall we say, than those of us that answer to God. (laughs) And, and, And Senator Warren and others want to abolish these clinics. And it, I, I, I'm glad you brought her up. <laughs> it, it, it goes back to, I think, the progressive idea of ideology everywhere is this is what we're going to say and we're going to shut the other side up. Yeah, yeah. And, and because they have the tech companies on in their camp and the media, there, there's really little to no pushback. Um, you reference uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren last, I believe it was last year, last year she was... Um, debasing pregnancy health centers and saying she wanted to shut them down and saying that they torture people and completely baseless. Um, and so far, so much as I've seen, she's not been held to account. So, you know, that's the landscape that we're in where whether it's a, a sitting U.S. senator, um, a state AG, they can say things with abandon and they're not held to account. And then they'll have the media also perpetuating it the you know, I hate to use scare quotes unnecessarily, but fake clinic is, is something that definitely gets the quote yeah. when, when you're writing things, because that's that's a term that gets thrown around a lot by abortion proponents, because, again, pregnancy health centers don't refer for or provide abortion, then that set makes them a fake clinic or they are not, they don't do the full scope of, rep- quote unquote, so-called reproductive health care. Yeah. Oh, I just simply, it, it's education, and as long as they can squash that, it seems to be, um, it, people just don't understand. I heard uh, the young lady from Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa, who is the president of Students for Life, grew up in Chicago, came to uh, Iowa, went to school at Loris, uh, was pro-choice, and one of her friends very lovingly explained to her why she was pro-life. Uh, the young lady who now is the president thought she was lying. And she tells a beautiful story about how she started to do the research and realized throughout her entire life, growing up in Chicago, her teachers, her parents, her family had lied to her about what abortion really was. And um, it's it's compelling. If you ever get a chance to listen to her, it, it just... It breaks my heart that our young ladies are being told these lies and being uh, sheltered from the truth. Um, I I think those are the kinds of stories. Also, we're hearing more and more anti or um, retired or uh, abortionists who have left the profession because their hearts had been transformed by the gruesome nature of what they've been doing in their profession. And those are the stories that really uh, we're being sheltered from, and we shouldn't be. Those those are the stories that will help us all learn that um, what we're promoting is is not good for society or or for our women. Absolutely. The truth is always where we need to be looking for our answers and for our motivation. It's just um, become become even more difficult to do that when you've got untruths being put out there by by folks in the media that have uh, positions of power and then also having the truth actively quashed by the same folks that are giving a a venue to the the folks that want to promote the falsehoods. All we can do is keep fighting. And you you gave a great example there, Gina, of sometimes it's one by one. One, you know, one person's story can affect so many others. So if we can hear a story like that, to, to amplify it any way you can or share it. But that's also, most of these, no, like I said, nobody's patting themselves on the back in the pregnancy health movement, but they are in that gap every day, no matter who comes to their door, no matter how, you know where they came from, what their story is, one person at a time, every single day. And, and it's really a 24-7 thing, too. Because, you know, Heartbeat has a 24-7 uh, bilingual contact center option line that many of these centers, when they're in their off hours, that's where the calls go. There, we have people round the clock, 365, answering phone calls, texts, and emails from women and families who are in need, and they, they connect them with the nearest local pregnancy health center. You know, if it's coming in in the middle of the night, it may be a couple hours so they can see another human being in person, but they are getting them in front of a human being as quickly as possible. So there are people that, you know, we take our holidays off at a heartbeat, and we always, you know, we pray every day as an 
organization, but we also remember when we go take a holiday off or even our weekends that we've got option line consultants answering the phone and text line 24-7, 365 to help people in need. And, and you know, so one by one, and all those one by ones, they definitely add up. So you know, anything that anybody can do in their individual position of life, it, it, whatever, you look for those opportunities and you take it. We can't change, you know, we can't necessarily make change from the top, all of us. And it can seem very, very overwhelming when you look at it, especially, you know, our elections didn't go the way they should, but we, 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 we don't stop. We don't give up. We keep the, looking for every opportunity to change hearts. The truth will ultimately set us all free. But you did mention something, um, Lisa, that I'm unaware of, and that's that uh, there are people that have days off. <laughs> <laughs> That really happens. It does, from time to time. (laughs) My my schedule is such that I don't get that luxury all the time, but uh, uh, we appreciate that you have yours. But anyway, we also appreciate that you've been able to join us today. Thank you so much. We'll probably see you at Mass again one of these times. Did you have something? uh, Yeah. Lisa, how do people get a hold of Heartbeat? uh, Maybe you should let us know, let our listeners know how they can um, reach out. So we, there's a number of different ways. Um, you know, again, the news site that I manage is pregnancyhelpnews.com, and that is Heartbeat's news site. So for sure, you know, feel free to come on to there, and then um, we have a weekly digest that um, you can subscribe, subscribe to. So anything that's coming out from Heartbeat that's uh, going to be something that we could report on the news, it will be there. But certainly... If you go to Heartbeat's website, you're going to see, and that's heartbeatinternational.org, you'll see all the different um, initiatives that we have, whether it's, pre- you know, pre- specifically pregnancy help, but we also have the abortion pill rescue network and option line and all sorts of things. Also, I want to remind everybody that Heartbeat has a uh, website called Pregnancy Center Truth, and that's pregnancycentertruth.com which refutes all of these falsehoods. So definitely check that out as well. Very good. Well, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we will... uh, I know we're going to have you back because (laughs) you can't stay away very long or we can't keep you away very long. Such good information. (laughs) It always has such good information. Lisa Bourne from Heartbeat International, thank you for joining us today. God bless you and your work. Great to be with you. Thank you. And we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're listening to Faith on Toronto on Iowa Catholic Radio. And Gina, um, interesting guest. Again, I know we use the word interesting all the time. i got to come up with another word. i got to get out my thesaurus. Well, I think and, today was a good story about uh, the the thread that between the two was about truth and mm-hmm. um, speaking the truth right. and sharing the truth. Um, I think both, um, you know, these fallacies that pregnancy centers are invalid or that we need to affirm um, the, uh, the despair gender dysphoria by punishing people who don't conform, you know, that that's not based in truth. Right. And I think part of the problem with this uh, school board thing was uh, they were prepared, if you weren't using the correct uh, terminology, the correct pronouns, to expel you from school. Right. And we see this in employment situations and, and on our federal um, interactions with our federal government. It's it's a trend. I hope in it, academia. I, I hope it mm-hmm. dies soon. <laughs> yeah, I hope it does. Too. It's a clown show, in my opinion. But we uh, certainly admire uh, Aletha for her column that she wrote and for the other writings that she does up there, putting the truth out to the people in the uh, Cedar Rapids area. Well, yeah, and it, right, because then they're getting. Um, and I, I thought her article was written in a in a fair manner, very matter of it fact, was, and not very. It much was opinion. beautifully written. I I was very impressed as a writer myself. I was very yeah, impressed well. with uh, her ability to write. And as well. a reader, I was also very impressed. good. Well, we, <laughs> there we, we go. We got both sides covered. <laughs> and of course, what is going on with the pregnancy help centers? Uh, again, it's uh, it's this cancel yeah. culture that's coming <laughs> along. They want to. They want to. I, don't, don't want another side to come out. It, I find it um, interesting that that they think um, having a pregnancy health center is a threat to women. I, no, it's you not. Know, and especially since you know they're the, the pro-choice yeah. group, right? Like 
I, from what I've um, learned in the pregnancy centers I've toured, you know, they, they talk to the woman about the barriers to this pregnancy and try to find ways to overcome these barriers or fears or um, whatever it is that's putting this pregnancy in crisis. And what results is usually a beautiful outcome. Not always. Sometimes the the that's woman right. still chooses abortion. But the um, Planned Parenthood centers and other abortion clinics don't literally talk to the woman about why are you here, you know, and try to overcome those barriers before they choose abortion. They're here, like, here's the difference. Some more money. Let's yeah, here, just here, here's provide the, an abortion. Here's the difference. You go to Planned Parenthood, they clinically do what they are asked to do. Right. Okay. You come to a crisis pregnancy center and you have people that will walk with you. And that's, that's the, the big upside here is that these people will stick with you, will help you, will walk you through this and will be there either way. And why is that a threat to a Planned Parenthood or abortion clinics? I'm, I'm not sure other than economic reasons. Yeah, yeah. How much, how much do they charge for an abortion? They lose that every time somebody wants to have a baby. Yes. And And I think it's up to us to pray for those attorney generals and people in leadership positions that take this particular stand and against life. And speaking of attorney generals, next week, our own attorney general, Brenna Bird, will be with us. We're Wonderful. Gonna, we're going to talk about some of this stuff, right? Yeah, right. she's involved in another lawsuit with right. other attorney generals. That's that right. Hopefully we'll That's chat right. about we'll that. We'll find out what's on her mind, but we're certainly going to talk about this. So we will have Brenna Bird here next week. Well, and unfortunately, abortion seems to be the key issue in either um, winning elections or defeating candidates. Um, I don't know if you remember in 2021 when the, the it w- there was a wonderful outcome and, and Republicans kind of took um, some uh, hope in the outcomes. But there was a in New Jersey there was a trucker, a delivery truck that? driver, right? Yes, yes. and he um, defeated the uh, speaker of the of the or uh, the, the president, president of the, of the Senate. Senate. Right. That's right in New Jersey. Uh, it came out of the blue. Well, unfortunately, on Tuesday night this week, he was defeated. So and one of the reasons he was defeated was his stand on, on abortion. Okay. He's pro-life. Yeah, and that's what we have to face. Interesting uh, article out, and we're not going to have a whole lot of time to discuss it, but uh, Barry Weiss, who was uh, uh, worked for the um, New York Times and left the New York Times over some of their policies, who was an art and liberal has written an interesting article that if you can find it on the uh, internet, uh, it's called End DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we've been talking about this for a long time. Sure, and and she has come part. around for this. So we're not going to have a chance to talk about it because we are running out of time. But we do have time uh, for our St. Michael's Prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, o Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. That's it for this week. Join us again next week at the same time. And again, we will have with us the Attorney General of the State of Iowa, Brenna Bird. So this weekend, make sure you go to church and take your kids. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients.